Okay, one second. I, I become presenter. Take so Anita Berni, she's um, she leads the strategy and execution at Kispe Space, and uh, we know her from uh, very well from last year. Uh, she was running a workshop, and she's going to also present, uh, talk a bit about this and the results and how to continue and build up uh, upon this. Uh, she's really focused on uh, space systems and, and the knowledge about it and to make this accessible to everyone. Uh, she was a director at Surrey Satellite Technology, and she is currently a member also of the board of directors of AAC Clyde Space. I don't know what's Clyde Space, <laughs> but uh, she's also, and that's, my God, I mean, if you have this in your CV, she is honorary group captain in Royal Air Force 601 Squadron. So everyone, be careful. <laughs> um, and KISPE, they're developing the world's first open source micro satellite platform. Um, so yeah, she's totally into open source and uh, hand over now to her. Uh, Fernando, did you manage yes, it? Uh, no, uploading. I, I, I yes, I have some troubles to put it in the screen. Sorry, uh, I have uh, uploaded. Anita, you need to unmute. I see you only connected with the headphones, um, so you should go to also but, uh, check the microphone. One, one, okay, one Fernando, I, I do it. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm trying to to set it, but I cannot. So here it is. Okay, thank you. Sorry. So um, Anita, now you are muted. Um, is it Excellent. I think I'm with you now. Good. Hi. Very good. Um, I have a number of uh, children competing for Wi-Fi and bandwidth, so uh, I may turn my camera off at some point. But it's really lovely to be with you uh, virtually this time, rather than in Athens. It was a fantastic conference last year. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, I can give you an overview, as you say, Arthur, of, of some of the results that we've had this year and some of the activities that we've been working on as well. Uh, 12 minutes isn't very long, so I'm going to be talking very much at the top level. And uh, I hope that you can take lots of questions and that you will contact me up afterwards and, uh, and we can continue the discussion in the chat as well. Uh, we at the at KISP and, and at the Open Source Satellite Program, we believe that open source space is going to be the next major disruptor for the space industry and that the teams who are participating in, in this workshop this weekend are really going to play a strong role in creating that future. Uh, so I'm going to present a snapshot of that ecosystem and also seek your thoughts and ideas. Right, how do I fast forward on here? How Sorry, do I, yeah, I have forgot to make you a presenter. So now. Oh, perfect, thank you. Loading. So here's what I'm gonna be sharing today. A quick look at what got us to where we are today, starting almost 30 years ago, would you believe? And um, uh, how the open source domain and, and the space domain have converged. Um, uh, I'll talk about a little bit of what we talked about last year uh, in Athens, and then I'm going to share an illustration that I've created of what the open source space landscape looks like. And then before turning to the, the discussion part of the talk, I'm going to share some updates on some of our activities over the past year. So in order to consider how open source and space can complement other and create new space missions, it's really interesting to look back and to trace the parallel histories of these areas of development and see how similar constraints led to their inception and see how the environments and, and the ecosystems and communities that they stimulated are creating the environment for open source space systems today. So back in the 1980s, we saw the very first flights of the modern microsatellites, and that was out of the University of Surrey here in the UK. And in the 80s, we also saw the first modern computers in the home. And that might seem like a really, you know, um, innocuous thing and, and a rather trivial thing, but it's really important because people used to have to go and book time on massive mainframe computers, physically go to where the computers were and load up their code. 
And to be able to do that from the comfort of your own home or from a you know a regular office was really the start of how we, we were able to work more rem remotely and more collaboratively. And then in the 1990s, we saw a gradual increase in experimental demonstration missions uh, in space. And we also saw on the open source software side of things, the software movement was starting to develop. And because of the restrictions that were imposed by commercial companies at the time, you know, they wanted strict access, they didn't want anyone to change anything, it was never very good. So that's how the open source software uh, community really began. And two great examples are Linux and MySQL, and you know they underpin many of our phones uh, and a lot of the functions that we have today uh, in a lot of our technologies. And then moving to the 2000s, we saw small sats transitioning from the academic and the scientific and experimental domain into commercial missions, and, and we gained a lot of uh, wider industry acceptance. But they were still quite large uh, as far as spacecraft go when we think about CubeSats uh, and quite expensive to launch because mass equals cost. And so the team out of Cowley and Stanford University developed the, the 10 by 10 by 10 uh, centimeter system a way of making experimental training spacecraft. And that really ignited the start of the CubeSat revolution. And at the same time, this is when it really started to get interesting because you started to get GitHub, GitLab, a lot of big data storage, data processing coming through from the open source side as well. So you can see these two areas, two domains starting to get much closely twined. And then in the 2000s, we saw commercial CubeSats, you know, small, really small spacecraft offering commercial capability. And that was really, really novel. And alongside that, you saw the maker community. So you started to see Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, SparkFun and, and Adafruit, making electronics really accessible for anyone to use. It didn't matter what your background was. You could tinker around, you could experiment, you could try and fail quite quickly and, and quite cheaply as well. And that's led us now to the 2020s, where we're seeing the first open source mission results from teams who are presenting this weekend. Um, and teams are coming together, linking open source software, open source hardware, and bringing that to the space domain. And, and this is really where we see the future going and being disruptor uh, for the future of the space industry. And so that really brings us to the present day. Uh, here are a few uh, photos from last year and the workshop that uh, I ran with my colleague, Dr. John Paffitt, who's the founder of KISP Space and also the initiator of the Open Source Satellite Program. And we ran an interactive workshop to seek the inputs of the participants about the teams that are active in the open source space community today. And we all went totally crazy with the post-it notes and the we came back with loads of paperwork, which we managed to distill down um, into the following chart, which is um, a bit of an eye test to, to look at uh, quickly today. But please do have a look at it. Uh, everyone who's seeing this chart can see their names, see their logos on here. If your names aren't on here, I need to know because I know this is complete, it's just a snapshot. But what I want to be able to do is with everyone's contributions and inputs, improve this and build upon it and use this as a way to show the, the maturity of the, of the ecosystem and to identify where gaps exist, where we've got key strengths and how we can work more closely together. Um, the open source space ecosystem, it's really developed in a similar way to the development of terrestrial open source applications and services. And it really reflects a number of activities that are active in each of each of the segments. And the segments with the most participation and maturity are those where the software is really the, the enabler. And uh, some of the first catalysts for open source space came from the imagery domain where free satellite data acted as the catalyst for lots of different applications and services. And you had modeling and simulation tools that were starting to come out of the closed source into the open source domain as well, which made it a lot easier to leverage all of this great data that was generated and being offered on the free market. And then you had NASA and ESA as well who were making uh, satellite imagery more available from their in-orbit assets that was stimulating this great use of all this data 
that's out there and finding new ways to use it and also stimulating ideas for new missions as well. And then from the hardware perspective, it was more about looking at the ground stations to begin with rather than the in-orbit assets. And that's something that we started to see change over the past few years with some of the missions that teams here are working on as well. And so we've seen that the conversion open source and space coming together is creating this fantastic catalyst for novel and non-traditional approaches to delivering space and space enabled systems uh, but what we think needs to happen now is you know we need to build that momentum more grow the system so that there's efficient uh, critical mass of capability across the value chain to enable the delivery of more missions and, and applications and, and programs so before I turn over to the Q&A session, I wanted to share some of the developments that we've been working on in the past year. So just a reminder what the Open Source Satellite Programme is all about. Our objective is to develop the world's first open source microsatellite platform. Um, in order for space to be truly democratised, we feel it's really important to create an order of magnitude improvement in price performance. And that's why we're looking at a microsatellite. And of course, CubeSats definitely have their place, and Sats also will have their place in this overall space ecosystem. So here's a picture of some of the work we're doing at the moment. We're in the last few days, actually. I think we might have concluded this week uh, our first radiation testing campaign on three candidate COTS microprocessors, so low cost, uh, Really robust, which is what we're going to find out during the testing of uh, decent performance microprocessors that we can use the basis for the for the platform processor and the open source microsatellite platform. Uh, we've just been awarded a contract to do the next phase of work, which is to prepare for proton testing, so that we can uh, determine their their uh, performance against single event upsets. And we will be releasing all of these results. Uh, out into the community. Uh, a lot of the, the testing that's done on processors and other devices is usually held uh, within organizations and institutions. We feel it's really important to share this information so that we can use that as a basis for stimulating more missions. And one more set of snapshots, really. Um, so we've got a number of software and systems activities underway. We're trying to find out, you know, in a similar way to Andre, trying to figure out the best way to release this out into the community. So we've got GitHub repositories. We've also got a number of channels uh, on Teams as well. And we're, we're really loving the Kanban function within, to, within Teams so that we can progress our activities through their, through their workflows as well and, and, and see, who, see how things are going. It's a really great tool. Um, so people who are collaborating with us, they've got access to these, but they're still, you know, uh, within a, a relatively close community. So we're trying to figure out the best way to open those up to a wider audience. So if you do want to see, get in touch, and we can we go onto those onto those channels. So that was a really quick run through, um, very top level. Um, do ask me questions. I'd love to talk more. And so just to move into the discussion section, which is really around the ecosystem, one, a couple of questions I wanted to ask, uh, uh, based on everyone's experience, you know, which, are the, which segments and capabilities are the ones that we need to focus on developing more? You know, which, where are the gaps? Which additional areas of capability need to be included to make sure that we have a well-structured, mature, complete value chain ecosystem? Who is from this map whose logos do I have I missed that I need to include and make sure that we're promoting the open source space community and and then and just a basic one at the end have I categorized this in the right way are there better ways of defining where people sit in the ecosystem so those are some questions to to get the conversation started um over to you guys thank you thank you Anita thank you very much um, yeah, actually, uh, we already have uh, one question. Pieros is uh, shouting yeah. out uh, yeah. regarding uh, not that there might be people or companies <laughs> missing logos, but rather the opposite, <laughs> that there might yeah. be too many that do not really adhere to the open source principles. 
Um, yeah. Maybe you want to say something to that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, really good question. Everyone has a slightly definition, slightly different definition of open source. That is true. But it's interesting you mentioned cost. When we met with them, um, oh, and I, uh, I think it was a year ago now at IEC, they've actually got some amazing work that they're doing on the payload side. Uh, admittedly, I haven't been onto their onto their repository to have a look at it, but um, they were talking about being able to release a, release some of their information they're doing on the payloads. Um, so that's a really good question. I agree. Not everyone sees open source in the same way, but I think that we need to start somewhere. And in, in that, I think the end objective has to be how do we make space more affordable and accessible, and sometimes tools and the underlying capability may not necessarily be open source, but they're accessible because they're at a sufficiently affordable price that they help to stimulate other things to happen. So it, it is a total gray area here, I know. Um, but and, and that's what I love about this debate, because I think everyone on this in this conference has possibly got a slightly different definition of what open source means. Um, I need to include a few uh, asterisks or maybe different um, uh, way of denoting those teams where they're not fully open source but have some elements that they want to share. Okay. Uh, yeah, Fernando. Yeah, we have a question from YouTube, Axeno, that uh, he's asking if uh, are you using agile approach for designing and development or more waterfall approach? Uh, and again, I mean, it's it's a case of one size doesn't fit all. I mean, some things work better as an agile approach, and and some of the activities we're working on with our collaborators are definitely following that that really rapid iterative approach uh, to to just something, trying it and moving on quickly. Others where we have um, from from our experience, we have uh, maybe a more mature a starting point for our thinking, then it may, maybe makes more sense to take a waterfall approach. But I, I think there's not a really a one size fits all. You have to think about what you want to get out of it, what your starting point is, and use this as your drivers for, for which approach suits you best. Okay, thanks. We have also one question from the attendees, from Daniel. Yeah, uh, hi Anita, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, just to, hi. Uh, as you are asking, uh, how are there alternative ways of categorization? Um, one thing I, I was thinking is uh, you may know the Gartner Magic Quadrant presentations, which are showing yeah. uh, maturity uh, as well as ex execution capability and all. Because in your current mm. visualization, you're putting basically everything on the same foot and saying uh, you're putting ESA at the same level as, uh, well, I'd say, other things. And maybe it could yeah. be interesting to, to show uh, something more nuanced in terms of where are they in terms of uh, ID or where are they. Uh, vision versus uh, actual execution, and uh, it could be applied to open source, saying, "Okay, at this stage, they have just published a few ideas, or actually, the full documentation is available." And this would enable maybe to to better visualize uh, what is actually open source. To answer one of the questions, what is really open source uh, as per the open source definition, and what is uh, ongoing mm. or going to open source? That is a really good question, and it's something I struggled with as I was thinking, how can I put just simple snapshot that's easy to understand together? And I was thinking, maybe I can do a heat map representation of some of that as well. I love the quadrant idea. I mean, I love a good two two by two grid for for defining lots of things. Um, maybe it needs I need to do a three three D version of that. But yeah, I will definitely look at a great great comment, Damien. Okay, I have also, um, I mean, my perception of this is, uh, well, first of all, there's uh, um, Sputniks in Russia. That's um, a company or an organization. They also want to build an open source microsatellite. That was my last information. Have you heard mm -hmm. about those? So not Sputnik, but Sputniks. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they've, they've recently started understanding uh, or, or awareness. I have in here yet but i will definitely okay and my my question was then our perception is that i mean most of us here i guess we are doing some kind of grassroots development in our garage and building our 
this sensor or, or this system. Um, but I perceive that you're basically, yeah, from the, let's say, you're an industry player. Uh, you talk with um, other companies and, and in, you talk with the industry. Uh, I'm, I'm just interested in if you can report on their reaction because, I mean, they live in the world of NDAs, ITAR, and confidenti <laughs> confidentially, and if you say open source, what is their reaction? It's interesting. I mean, talking to ESA, I mean, you guys know they're they're very supportive of of new ways of trying to do you know things differently, and to find ways of bringing capability closer to people. So I think that they're probably one of the biggest challenges in NASA. Uh, there are there are a few groups we're talking to at the moment who are really fascinated by the idea of developing what we're calling a next generation microsatellite platform, something that is performant and robust and flexible for the price or the cost of a CubeSat. And there are a lot of people who would like access to that capability because at the moment business cases aren't able to close. It's just taking, it, it's all about time. It's taking too long to develop a system to get to the point where it's ready to launch and it costs too long to get there. And then once you launch the spacecraft, the, the lifetime of the mission is too short for you to make your money back. So the, the, the dynamics of the, the, the business case are working. So there are a lot of people who are really keen to have access to a design that will help them to short circuit that, that current blocker in, in getting to the point where they can have a commercial or sustainable mission. So there's, there is actually a lot of interest. Um, and and we're, we're, we're working with a few teams to well, to determine how best to structure involvement in the program. There are a number of different models that we're considering. OK, thanks again. Um, with this, uh, well, there will be the Hangout session later to talk uh, maybe a bit more about this. Um, thank you. So thank you. And we go to our